Hello and welcome to Phuket Pals. In today's social studies video, we're going to talk about knowing the United States Constitution. The Constitution of the U.S. can be a little intimidating because, well, it was written a long time ago. The 18th century language that the American colonists used is not very similar to what we use today, so you may find it a little bit tough. However, we're going to go over it part by part, understand the principles and the parts of it, so that you can feel confident when you sit the GED exam. Let's get right to it. Why was the Constitution written? Well, the colonists, after fighting their bloody American Revolutionary War, wanted to create a better country for themselves and for their children in the future. During the Age of the Enlightenment, the colonists had decided that they believed that the natural rights of man, thus rights given to them by God in which they believed were inalienable, could not be taken from them, were the foundation for their society. The history of the United States Constitution is quite deep. We're just going to talk about a little brief explanation so we can move on to the fundamental parts that you need to understand for the test. So the document was written by James Madison at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia between May 25th and September 17th in the year 1787. Though James Madison wrote the document, the Founding Fathers Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and George Washington assisted in, in the creation of the document at the convention. One of the founding fathers, Patrick Henry, who could be famous for being the first person to say, I am not a Virginian, I am an American, and who also so bluntly said, give me liberty or give me death, was notably absent at the Constitutional Convention because he believed that the new constitution was giving the federal government too much power, and he was skeptical. There are six big ideas contained in the constitution, and the founding fathers argued and debated about how to best proceed after the failings of the limited government in the Articles of Confederation. They still wanted to hold on to the idea of limited government and minimize government's power and influence over the common citizen, but to less extent than previously. They also espoused republicanism. So public opinion reflects the voters who elect officials who are the most informed about the issues. This was a way about having the people choose who would make the laws for them without having to know everything required to do it themselves. Checks and balances, uh, balances was that each branch of the government can place a check on the other so that its political power would not be too concentrated. This was a way to prevent abuse of power by any one branch. And then we have the fourth idea, which was federalism. This is just where there is a relationship between the roles of the federal government, the state governments, and it even goes on to smaller governments like city and county governments. Fifth was the separation of powers. This was the act of placing legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government in separate bodies or groups. Again, this was to make sure that no one part of the government became too powerful. You can't mention enough how fearful of tyranny the United States sen uh, colonists had become. And the last idea these new Americans sought was popular sovereignty. This is the idea that was very novel in this time, before the people got their power from the governing body. But this new idea stated that the government gets its power, its legitimacy, and its rule from the power and the will of the people. In other words, the people submitting to the government is what gave it its power over them. So let's jump right in and talk about the different parts of the Constitution. We'll go into details about each part later, but for now let's just note that the Constitution can be broken down into three parts. The Preamble, which is essentially an introduction. The Articles, which go on to define how the government and its bodies will work. And three, the Amendments. Those detail rights and other details and can be changed or added upon. So here, the preamble. I'm not going to read the preamble to you. It's long and in 18th century English. But 
Feel free to pause the video and read it yourself. It's a good idea to get comfortable with reading these old documents because we will start to better understand them with practice. Remember, my key tip for you in passing the GED is practice, practice, practice. The more you read, the more you become familiar with the terminology, the better chance you have at feeling confident when you sit down to start the test. So we can talk about the main ideas of the preamble. The first was to form a more perfect union, which meant they could create a stronger and a more effective government than those Articles of Confederation which failed so miserably. And you probably will do some studying of the Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation mostly failed because they had a single branch and no way to create uh, tax revenue. Number two was to establish justice. They wanted to form a better system of courts and a trial system so that people could have a just system in which they would be tried for crimes. This was mostly because of the unjust system that they had faced under British rule. Three, to ensure domestic tranquility. This is just saying that they want to keep the peace between the states. From the beginning of the forming of the Union, the colonists, now Americans, quickly forgot the lessons they learned they should have learned from the lack of compromise with them and the British, and they started squabbling amongst themselves almost immediately. It took years just to solve territory debates between states, uh, disputes between states. Number four, they really need to provide for the common defense. It was important for the United States, a new nation in a world of great power empires, to create an army that could protect them. Uh, they also wanted to promote the general welfare. They wanted to guard the right of people to work for a high standard of living and have good living conditions. They really cared about the future as well. We can see in the sixth point, to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. Posterity is what we leave behind. They wanted to safeguard the freedoms for their generations and their families to come and other Americans. The next part we'll talk about are the articles. Here we have seven articles and a summation on the right side of the table. So articles one through three created the three branches of government. The fourth article was trying to explain the relationship of states to one another and the relationship to the national government. They wanted to make sure that each state gave citizens and other states the same right. Uh, the fifth article is the way in which we could amend the Constitution or change the Constitution, which we'll deal with in the next slide. Uh, the Sixth Amendment, the Supremacy Clause, was stating that federal law trumps state law. And the seventh article was the way in which they could ratify the Constitution or put it into effect. It's a good idea to understand the purposes of the articles in a broad sense. We don't need to memorize the exact wording for each of the articles, but we should understand what they did and how they created the government. As we start talking about the amendments, let's begin with the Bill of Rights. The first ten amendments of the Constitution of the United States are known as the Bill of Rights. They were added during ratification and they are a clear and concise listing of the rights of the citizens of the United States. So let's go over some really important ones. The first gives the citizens of the United States freedom of speech, the press, assembly, and to petition the government. These were very important freedoms that the Americans fought hard against the British to obtain for themselves these are also key freedoms that have moved on in modern Western liberal democracy and are espoused in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Number two is unique to the United States. The, so the Americans were so worried about further invasions that they required and allowed all Americans to the right to keep and bear arms and keep a well-regulated militia, which means they could have guns. Number three, 
The third amendment was pretty much a response to the abuse of the British soldiers over American homes and businesses and allowed for no quartering of soldiers without explicit permission. The fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, these amendments talk about in the case of a, being accused of crimes or tried for crimes or sentenced for crimes, how the government can handle its citizens and the rights of the citizens to avoid being mistreated. Uh, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments are just covering more rights. We don't need to know them off uh, the top of the head or be able to recite them for the test. Remember, it's limited uh, to the application of factual knowledge. We don't need to know everything. We need to know the big pictures and be able to discuss them and draw conclusions from texts about them. So some key terms we can use for the Bill of Rights are the five freedoms. That First Amendment right, uh, those First Amendment rights which we talked about earlier, which include speech, religion, press, assembly, and to petition. And then the Amendments 4 through 8 are what we call the rights of the accused, those accused of crimes. So I hope you've had an enlightening experience learning about the basics of the Constitution. Just remember the Constitution is not that complicated. All you have to do is understand the basic parts and be familiar with the key terms and you don't need to know every single detail about it. It's an old document, so the more you look at old documents, the more confident you'll be. Go over the Declaration of Independence. Read primary sources written at the time and you'll become more comfortable with that style of English. When you sit down at the chair, be confident, decisive, and trust your intuition. And I'll end with a quote from Henry Ford, which I think applies to all test-taking. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. <laughs>